many of you have a poster of someone like Ryan Gosling or maybe you know the star from High School Musical in your locker. Maybe it's Drake. But for me, I've got a picture of Eric Erickson in my locker. Eric Erickson was a Neo-Freudian. Neo-Freudian means he studied with Freud and he took Freud's work and went in a different direction. You see, he had two major criticisms of Sigmund Freud's work. The first being that Sigmund Freud's work stopped at age 12. Eric Erickson was not at uh, he was not alone in this criticism. Lots of other developmental psychologists agreed that no development goes all the way till we put you in the coffin. I mean, development goes from conception to coffin, and Erickson knew that. He also had a problem with the fact that Freud's um, work was so geared to sex, right? We talked about that being in the unconscious for Freud, and that drove everything that we do. Erickson agreed that sex is part of life, a big part of life, and it drives our behavior. However, it's under the context of something called psychosocial development. It's under the umbrella of something bigger. Psychosocial development are all of your social, your social relationships and your need for those and how that determines your personality and your emotional life and your psychology. So um, Eric Erickson really um, came up with this massive term called psychosocial development. And in any lifespan growth and development course, you're going to find that Eric Erickson is really responsible for a huge percentage of that course because of coming up with that whole domain of, of work called psychosocial development. A domain is an area where we develop. So yes, we develop physically, cognitively, and psychosocially. And he began to explain that. Now, the way that he did it was very much like Freud. He divided your life into stages. Um, however, his went all the way to death, and his stages, he had eight significant stages. The one we're talking about today is the first stage. Now, that first stage is from zero to one or so. Um, different textbooks will kind of argue about, is it zero to one or 18 months or whatever. We're going to look at just say zero to one. And something you need to understand about all of Erickson's work is really, we don't have a, oh, all of a sudden, you're one years old, now you've moved to this new developmental um, stage. It's kind of this area of, of development where we kind of move into a new area can happen. Uh, it might be a year, it might be 18 months, depending on your maturation. But um, we'll just still go with zero to one for right now. And we're going to talk about it. I'll ask you kind of, you know, what happens for a person when they're zero to one? Well, they do a lot of peeing and pooping and puking and crying, don't they? I mean, if you've had a newborn baby in the home, you know that's true. That a newborn baby does a lot of sleeping, peeing, pooping, puking and crying. Now, the brilliance of Eric Erickson is he saw all of those biological things, not as simply biological, but part of a bigger psychosocial picture. So let me kind of give you a, a picture of what it's like to bring a new baby home. For my daughter, Presley, she was the first grandchild on my wife's side of the family, and she was the first grandchild forever on my side of the family. She was that oldest child in my home. Uh, for many of you, you're watching this and you were the oldest child in your home. And you look at your baby brother and sister and think, oh, they're so spoiled, right? I mean, if you're the oldest child, you're nodding your head and saying, yes, my baby brother and baby sister is spoiled. I've come to you today as a professional to let you know there is nobody more spoiled than the oldest child. Because I have brought three children home and my oldest child received more attention than any of those other children. Honestly, the other two combined, my older child got more attention. I mean, we had people coming and visiting all the time. We had showers. It was like parades in the street for this girl. And so, you know, we had her in the hospital. And um, at the time, you had your choice of sending the baby to the nursery and letting, kind of trying to get caught up on sleep before you go home. Or you could you could actually um, have your baby in the room with you and keep him there. And my wife and I, that first baby, we were like, we will not. You know, we will, we will not let the nursery have her. We're going to keep her in here 24-7. I mean, we didn't sleep for three days. We just watched her sleep, just holding her, watching her breathe. My second and third kid, we're like, how long will you keep them? And we sent them to the nursery and try to get caught up on our sleep. I mean, when we got home with my daughter, Presley, it was a um, funny thing because We'd worked on this nursery for, for hours, and instead we let her sleep in the room right beside us in this thing called a bassinet, and it was right beside our bed. 
For the second and third child, please don't get this picture of you sleeping beside your mom and dad's bed in your head. In fact, you were probably in the garage or out there with the dogs if you were the second or third child. My oldest child, though, man, she got to be right there in the room with her, with us, and we got to watch her as she breathed and watch her chest rise up and down, and it was really a, a magical moment when you um, look and you watch that and you've got that new baby in the home. And then she did it. She made this little noise. She went, and she cried. And uh, for first time parents, man, we jumped up and we're like a NASCAR pit crew. We are changing diapers. My wife is feeding her. We are bouncing her. My wife was singing to her the, the hits of Britney Spears, like, hit me, baby, one more time, you know, bouncing her around. I mean, that's such a great lesson for a young lady to hear, right? Hit me, baby, one more time. And um, what did my daughter just learn about the universe around her when she cries? <laughs> The universe responds, right? Those caregivers, mom and dad, we respond. Now let's talk very quickly about a baby's senses. You know, a a newborn um, has a, a very acute a very acute hearing. In fact, we know they can actually hear in the womb. You can play them in the mu music in the womb, and then later research will show they actually recognize that music they were played in the womb. It's amazing. They have a very powerful sense of smell. In fact, you can take a stranger's breast milk and put it on a breast pad and her mother's breast milk and put it on her breast pad and the baby will sniff each breast pad after six hours, only six hours after being born, baby will begin to root for mom's breast pad. She can identify what mom's breast milk smells like, a very acute sense of smell. We know that babies um, feel. I mean, they avoid pain in the womb. And I promise you, when they're born, they let you know they feel, right? We know that a baby loves sweet things. So we know their, their taste is even developed. They love sweet things. Now, the one sense it isn't very developed, you guessed it, is sight, right? And so for a baby, it's going to be six to eight months or so before they have this thing called depth perception. It's very difficult them to see, for them to see layers of perception, and so they can't do that until about six or eight months. And um, they have a difficult time tracking a moving object in space. I mean, you don't want to take a baby to a ping pong match. It's like... I mean, they can't track all of that, right? You don't take babies to ping pong. And so they can't track a moving object in space. However, the one thing they see may be better than anything else is the human face. I mean, the human face, think about it. You've got a nose, got this hood ornament, and then this hood ornament sticks out, and the baby is able to uh, focus in on that, and it brings the rest of your face into view. You've got this hairline, and that hairline, I mean, some of you have got a full beard. You've got a full frame basically around your face. And that frame actually brings the image inside of it forward, your face forward, just like we put a frame on a picture to bring the image to the foreground of our perception and everything else to the background so we can focus in on it. Your face was designed to be seen by a baby. So I want you just to um, get the image of, of a baby laying on their back in a crib and looking up, and they see two basically round orbs that are kind of floating around their crib the hairy orb and the pretty planet. They've got those two things that are orbiting their crib, gravitating around them, their parents' faces. I never want you to lose the image of a newborn baby looking up and seeing their parents' faces orbiting around their crib. Those faces are their worlds. They're everything to them. In fact, the human baby is born defenseless. Um, without mom and dad, they die. Mom and dad provide all of their needs. And so, in eating and changing a diaper and all of those things, Erickson didn't see these biological tasks that have to be done. He sees these biological tasks that lead to something bigger called attachment. Lots of research has been done on attachment, and in layman's terms, attachment is simply the emotional glue that bonds a baby, baby to its caregiver that first year of life. It's a critical window. It's, it's a time when um, the baby is going to do this during this time better and differently and, and maybe only. This is the only time of their life when they'll do this. And so that, that connection with mom and dad, that first year of life, according to Erickson, is going to be the foundation then of all of their development. It's going to be the emotional glue that they um, put on every other relationship from here on out. 
So when they're in a romantic relationship with someone, that's the emotional glue they'll, they'll put there. Where they're, they're um, friends, they'll adhere themselves to that emotional glue. So that sounds great, but you may have guessed it. What if their needs weren't met? What if mom and dad didn't provide that attachment to them? We have all sorts of research that's going to show that that baby could have neurological issues, could have developmental issues, and um, could even lead to problems with intimacy and attachment even in later life. And so we find that that is the foundation of everything. Now, if you've ever built a house, you know the importance of a foundation. So I want you to pretend we're building a house as we're talking about Erickson, and attachment is the foundation for everything. The rest of the house rests on it. And if there's a crack in the foundation, we know that it will haunt the child for later developmental periods. I remember when I used to work for um, a foster care agency that I, I got a call in the middle of the night. One of my jobs was to help place children into homes, foster homes. And I got a call in the middle of the night and police had busted into a meth lab. And um, in the corner of that meth lab was a six month old sleeping on her back. And they had called Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. You may have heard them called CPS. That's what we used to call them. And um, the worker called me and said, hey, there's a six-month-old baby. And um, she was found in the meth lab. Do you have a home for her? And I'm a huge advocate and fan of foster parents. I called this, this woman in the middle of the night, this crazy lady, said, bring her on. I'll take this six-month-old baby. She said, I'm going to go to Walmart and spend hundreds of dollars getting ready for this baby. You bring her on. And so I called the caseworker back and said, great news. I've got a home. I've got this crazy, amazing foster parent that'll take um, this baby in the house. And she said, there's a problem. We are going to run her by the doctor. We're going to run her by the emergency room and let a physician actually remove her diaper. You see, she's been laying in her own feces for so long without a diaper change. We are concerned it could cause actual internal damage to the baby if we just try to peel away that diaper. We're going to let a doctor um, remove that diaper where he's got the tools where he can do that that won't cause her any damage. So let's imagine for her, she's been, that little baby's been on her back not just for hours, but, but now for days, and screaming and screaming and screaming and crying. Crying is our first attempt to contact our outside world. And when she cries, she probably passes out, and then she cries again and passes out, and nobody comes and changes her diaper. There's a crack in her foundation. And according to Erickson, who studied under Sigmund Freud, um, those things go into her unconscious and will then dictate and drive her behaviors and her personality and her psychology from then on. And so there's a crack in the foundation of her home that could cause massive problems. That stage he calls trust versus mistrust. You learn to trust your caregivers. You learn to trust um, the world around you and you learn to trust yourself. I mean, if I can control my world, I can trust myself because I can control the world around me with that crying. So every stage of Erickson, there is a name. This one is trust versus mistrust. And every stage builds into the next stage. So if there's a problem in the previous stage, it's going to cause you problems in the later stage. It's going to come back and haunt you. So um, as we talk about trust versus mistrust, just remember we're building a house. And this one is the foundation.